um hello everybody uh, welcome back uh, i hope uh, you had a good day today um we actually uh, i'm just going to recall uh, whatever we discussed uh, in the yesterday's class uh, the first thing that we talked about in the yesterday's class was actually a recall of what we had discussed in the first day uh, that was about the overall uh, audit planning that what exactly is the audit planning all about okay uh, so uh, we did discuss uh, about uh, we did discuss about uh, the various uh, we talked about the audit uh, risk we kind of, we went through one of the question about the audit risk once we did the audit risk uh, scenario then i actually moved forward and i started discussing about the um, audit procedures pertaining to eps and pertaining to the short term investment so we went through that also and then at the next stage what we actually did was uh we went through we move forward and we said that uh, the next stage of the audit is actually the review stage and what exactly is that review stage of the audit so in that what we talked about was we said that uh, once you have performed the audit then the next step is about the finalization of the audit so whenever we talk about finalization of the audit so what actually happens is uh, that um, the senior manager or a partner he actually reviews the work that has been performed up till now he reviews the working papers and the result of that whole uh, review is that uh, he is then able to actually uh, judge if the if the entity if, if the audit firm can actually move forward and can go for the conclusion of this audit or not so that's what we discussed yesterday we are going to continue with the same thing uh, today also uh, so first thing that we are going to do is that you have the handouts here you have the handouts available in this um, in this handout section the first question that we are going to start discussing today is going to be question number 2 of uh, it's going to be question number 2 of december 2014 so it's going to be december 2014 question number 2 december 2014 question number 2 so uh, the question december 2014 question number 2 let's come on to that uh, question and we'll discuss that the requirement to the question is then again uh, the same requirement which is comment on the matters to be considered and state the audit evidence that you would expect to find in my in your review of the audit working paper so it's then again comment on the matters to be considered and explain the audit evidence that you would expect to find in your review uh during the audit of review of the audit working paper in respect of each of the issues described above so let's uh, take 3 uh, 4 minutes and uh, go through part a of the question so then we will start discussing once you are done with part a of the question read part a take 5 minutes
uh, the name of the question is Williams and Co. In fact, it's Francis Group. The name of the question is Francis Group. Okay, uh, let's just start discussing this question. Uh, if I talk about this question, so see that uh, it says you are the audit manager, you are the manager in the audit department of Williams & Co. and you are reviewing the audit working papers in relation to Francis Group, the group, whose uh, financial year ended on 31st July 2014. So the year end is financial 31st July 2014. Your firm audits all components of the group. I am going to explain this, uh, what do we mean by all components of the group. So we are going to talk about it, which consists of a parent company and three subsidiaries, Marks, Roberts, and T-Bot. Uh, the group manufactures engines, which are then supplied to the car industry. The draft consolidated statement of financial position recognized profit and loss of 23. Total assets of 450, and last year it was 455 million. Now. Uh, let's just try to understand a few things, uh, uh, which is number one, uh, we haven't actually gone through the group audit yet, but there is an ISA which is called ISA 600, which is uh, uh, the special considerations and the audit of group financial statement. When we talk about ISA 600, that what is ISA 600 all about? So ISA 600 actually is applicable for the group audit. And what does ISA 600 states? So ISA 600 actually refers to a concept of uh, a component. And what is a component in accordance with ISA 600? So component in accordance with ISA 600 is uh, an entity whose results are included in, whose results are included in group financial statements whose results are included in group financial statements. That means whenever we talk about, whenever we talk about a component, so the component could actually be your subsidiary, the component could actually be an uh, associate, the component could actually be um, a joint venture, the component could be anything. So it could be subsidiary, it could be associate, it could be joint venture. Generally speaking, what happens is, uh, Usually speaking, usually what happens is there is a parent company's auditor who usually audits the components, but that's not necessary. So at times what happens is when the component has a different auditor, when the component has a different auditor, then what happens is since you will be forming an opinion on the group financial statements. At a group financial statements, uh, Group financial statements include the include the information pertaining to the component also. The group financial statements include the information containing to the component also. So if you are auditing the group financial statement, then what actually happens uh, with the group financial statement is that um, <coughs> you have to rely on the work of the component auditor. You have to rely on work of component auditor. So when we have to rely on work of component auditor, so we need to be a bit careful before we place reliance because the reason behind that is if let's say that uh, results of component are misstated. Let's assume if the results of component are misstated, 
results of component are misstated, then what will happen is it will lead to group financial statements to be misstated also. And if you are auditor for the group, you will be responsible for the opinion that's being formed on the group financial. You will be responsible for the opinion formed on the group financial statement. So as a, as a group auditor, you need to understand that whether you should place reliance on the work of component auditor or not, you need to understand that specific factor. So that is one thing. Uh, now let's uh, move forward and let's just discuss further. So that is what we have talked about when it comes to the group financial statement. That is what we have talked about. Now let's move forward. So in this case, if you're going to see, it says you're a manager in the audit department of Williams and Company reviewing etc. etc. You could actually see this thing that you audit all the components of the uh, all the components of the group, which means that reliance on the work of the component auditor actually goes down mean that uh, the overall risk for the audit actually goes down. But one thing is, uh, last year it was 23 million as the profit, current year it's 33 million. That means there is a 10 rupee decline in the profit over a 33 million, uh, which is equivalent to something like uh, 31, 32 percent, something like that, a decline in the profit, which is a surprising element. And uh, the thing is, uh, there are total assets which are 450 and 455. So if you talk about the total assets, so you would say that total assets have only declined by 450 divided by 455. So that's how it is. Let's move forward. If you move further, we will discuss that uh, information in respect of the three issues has been highlighted for your attention during the file review. Um, it says uh, an 80% shareholding in teapot was acquired on 1st August 2013. Remember the dates are very important. When did you acquire on 1st August 2013, which was the first day of the current year. It says the goodwill on the acquisition was 27 million and was calculated uh, at that date and remains recognized as intangible at that value at the year end. Now, let's just try to understand one thing. It remains at that value at the year end also. Now, what does this mean? Uh, IS uh, 36 states that uh, the goodwill should be tested. The goodwill should be tested for impairment at each year end. Impairment at each reporting date. So the goodwill should be tested for impairment at each reporting date. That's what IS 36 states. Now, if you see this scenario, you could see that the company's profits are going down. So whenever the company's profits are going down, so if the profits of the company are going down, this would actually lead to an indication that the company is not generating cash flows. And if the company is not generating cash flows, that's an indication of impairment of goodwill. But the question says that the goodwill was originally calculated at 27 million and it is still being carried at 27 million. That means they have not tested the goodwill for impairment. They have not tested goodwill for impairment. That's what it indicates. So that's the first thing that has uh, actually, uh, that's what we have actually gone through in the question and we have understood. Uh, now let's move uh, forward and uh, discuss further. It says, uh, the goodwill calculation performed by the group's management is shown below. Number one is purchase consideration 75. Fair value of the 20% NCI 13,000 and less the fair value of identifiable net assets is 61 and the goodwill is 27,000. If you move further, it says in determining the fair value of identifiable net assets at acquisition, an upward fair value adjustment of 300,000 was made to book value of property recognized in teapot's financial at a carrying amount of 600,000 and then it says a loan of 60 million was taken out uh, on 1st August to help finance the acquisition. Loan carries an annual interest rate of 6% with interest payments made annually in areas. The loan will be repaid in 20 years at a premium of 5 million. Now, let's just try to actually understand. Uh, we did discuss that whenever the question requirement is uh, comment on matters to be considered and state the audit evidence that you would expect to find. So what are you going to talk about? You will talk about the materiality. The first thing that you will talk about, you will talk about the materiality. If I say what is materiality, let's just understand. Uh, number one of them is 27 million. So that 27 million 
is actually uh, the goodwill and if I compare this goodwill has to be compared by 450 million which is being the total assets. So it's 27 divided by 450 which I guess is around uh, something like 6% or 5 point something percent. So which is actually a material element. This is material number one. Uh, number two is So this is material. Now the next thing is uh, the purchase consideration of 75 fair value of NCI was so and so so and so and in determining the fair value it had this upward adjustment. Now in addition to this there was this 60 million of the loan. The 60 million again divided by 450. So it then again gives you something like um, uh, you would have this uh, uh, you would have more than this some 15 16 percent uh, if you could actually calculate the correct percentage so but I think that this is material thirteen percent so okay so that is thirteen point three percent so that is material now what next uh, so what will we do we'll talk about the accounting treatment we'll talk about the materiality and we'll talk about if there are any risk pertaining to it and uh, any things that are there and then we can actually talk about the evidence. So let's just talk about the first thing which is uh, we would talk about the goodwill calculation and we would say that uh, goodwill is uh, material as it is 6% of total assets or whatever that is the correct percentage.
Um, okay. Um, I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, there was some um, there was some uh, problem with the connection, so we lost the connection. Uh, but we are back now. Uh, sorry about that. Anyways, uh, coming back to uh, what we were discussing. So what we actually need to do is that we need to talk about materiality. We talked about materiality. The next thing is that we need to talk about the accounting treatment. So what exactly are we going to do? We would say that uh, goodwill should be tested for impairment at year end and any impairment loss shall be recognized in PNL. Furthermore, if um, if the property is depreciable, then excess depreciation on fair value adjustment shall also be recognized. So you would see this, that uh, basically we are talking about the accounting treatment. We are talking about it, that uh, the goodwill was calculated. We calculated the materiality of the goodwill. And once we calculated the materiality of the goodwill, we also talked about the relevant accounting treatment for the goodwill. And what is going to be that relevant accounting treatment for the goodwill? So the relevant accounting treatment for the goodwill is going to be that you need to test this goodwill for impairment at the year end. And if there is any impairment loss, you need to recognize this impairment loss into the profit and loss account. Furthermore, what we need to do is we need to actually, uh, we have made a fair value adjustment and upward value adjustment to the property recognized in Teapot's financial statement. So what do we need to do? What we actually need to do is that we need to actually charge an excess depreciation on this upward valuation that has been done. So the upward valuation that has been done, we need to charge an extra depreciation onto it. That's what we need to do. Uh, so you are going to write that accounting treatment. And if there are any risks which you think are uh, there, then you can write those risks also. Like uh, over here, the risk would be that uh, the fair value, the risk might actually be that uh, the fair value of non-controlling interest is incorrect. That is one of the risks. Um, the another risk could actually be the fair value of identifiable net assets. The fair value of identifiable net assets not correctly recognized. That could be also things, but that could all have an impact on the goodwill calculation. So that is one thing that you will talk about. So you identified goodwill, you talked about its accounting treatment, and you'll talk about that what could actually be the problems with respect to this goodwill. a depreciable property or if it's a non-depreciable item. So you need to recognize the extra depreciation. Uh, extra depreciation is like for the individual books, it was 600,000 as the carrying amount for the group accounts. It's actually uh, 900,000. So there is going to be an extra depreciation involved. Okay, then what has happened is you have obtained a loan of 60 million on 1st August 2013 to help finance the acquisition. The loan carries an annual interest rate of 6% with interest payments made annually in areas. The loan will be repaid in 20 years at a premium of 5 million. See, if this loan is uh, repayable at premium, if this loan is repayable at premium, then what does this indicate? If the loan is repayable at premium, this actually indicates 
uh, that uh, you need to calculate the effective interest rate. You need to calculate the effective interest rate. Now, if I give a general or a basic example of what exactly is an effective interest rate, so I'm going to say effective interest rate is like this. If you talk about this loan, it's a, uh, this loan is actually 6%, 60 million. This loan is 6%, 60 million loan for a five-year term. So if I talk about it, you would see that uh, the payment on this loan that you will make over a period of time, you need to see. You'll say year one till year five, it is going to be 6% into 60 million into five years so if I say 6 6 is 36 it's 3.6 million and uh, 5, 3, 15, 5, 6, 13. so it's going to be 18 million which is going to be the interest to be paid over a period of five years and then when we are gonna repay so basically the repayment is going to be uh, in total in fact if we see we have received 60 million we are going to pay this 18 million and we are going to repay 65 million. So effectively, if you see, it's 60 minus 18 minus 65. It gives you 23 million as the payment over a period of five years. If you divide it by five, you would come across something like 4.6. So if I say 4.6 divided by 60 give you some other rate. What is that rate? Four point six divided by sixty. Okay, so this is seven point six percent. Now, what is this seven point six percent? This seven point six percent is indicating the overall cost is indicating the overall cost on this specific loan. It is indicating the overall cost on this specific uh, loan. So uh, the IFRS 9, it requires us to recognize the finance cost using effective interest method. The IFRS 9 requires the finance cost using the effective interest method. So what do you mean by that? That actually means that what you do is that if in case, if it's 7.6, I mean, it's just a random. Otherwise, practically, we use the IRR for calculation. But I've just performed a calculation just to give you people an idea that this is the overall cost that you're bearing over a period of time. So what happens is, like you've got an opening liability of uh, 60 million. You will have effective interest at the rate of 7.6%, uh, which gives you 46 you have got cash interest at the rate of 6% gives you 3.6. So there is actually an amortization of 1 million which will be added to it and it will become 61 million. So the way it has to be accounted for is basically uh, it's going to be, uh, the way it is going to be accounted for is going to be that we would recognize finance cost as 4.6 million. We would recognize the cash as 3.6 million and we would recognize the financial liability at 1 million. So that's what we will do. That's how we would recognize this whole. That's what we will do. That's how we will recognize this whole. Now, let's just try to understand things. What has actually happened is, um, this is what the accounting treatment is, that if you have got a financial uh, liability, so you have to carry that liability and amortized cost. And we talk about the carrying the liability and amortized cost. That means the interest to be recognized in the profit and loss should be using effective interest rather than the cash interest rate. So that's what you have to explain. So you have to explain that uh, the overall what you need to explain with respect to this uh, entire thing is you need to tell this uh, examiner that look, this liability is basically uh, uh, of uh, 60 million is a material item, but it has to be recognized. This liability of uh, uh, is material item, but the accounting treatment has to be like this: that it has to be carried at amortized cost with the finance cost recognized in the profit and loss account to be using the effective interest rate instead of the cash interest rate. So that's how you will actually answer it. Uh, I'm going to move forward, and I'm going to now discuss further. So if I move further, I'm going to discuss uh, about the evidences. So this is what you would talk about, the accounting treatment, now the evidences. 
I've always told you that you need to think that uh, what is the risk. Once you have thought about the risk, then you actually try to perform the procedures to address those risks and the result of the procedure is you get an audit evidence. The result of the procedure is you get an audit evidence. Now, let's just try to understand this thing. If I say risk, the procedure and the evidence, so what am I going to do now? Uh, what are the risks that you face in this scenario? The risk that we are facing in these scenarios is, is number one, the fair value of NCI to be incorrect, the cost of investment to be incorrect. Another risk that we are facing is that the cost of investment will be incorrect. The other risk that we are facing is goodwill is not tested for impairment. That's another risk that we are facing. Um, uh, if I move further, so it would be like uh, the goodwill is not tested for impairment and then uh, the property no excess depreciation charged then if I move further I would talk about that loan is carried at uh, the uh, loan is basically carried at its original uh, carrying amount then there would be that uh, instead of uh, cash interest Instead of effective interest, you have recognized the interest expense at cash interest. So there could also be the thing that uh, cash interest is recognized instead of effective interest. So now, if we actually come across these things, so what can we do in this scenario? We could actually have a lot of evidences. Because you see, the evidences then again for those who were not here uh, in the yesterday's and day before yesterday's class. So... I did talk about it that whenever the examiner says evidence, so you need to distinguish between the evidence and the procedure. The procedure is an action that you perform as an auditor. Evidence is the result of the action that you obtain. Evidence is the result of the action. So there is one thing which is called procedure. There is one thing which is called uh, uh, the evidence. The procedure is the action and evidence is the result of the action. So if I need, if I am facing a risk that the fair value of the non-controlling interest is not correct, what am I going to do? I'm going to simply perform the procedure, which is I'm going to uh, uh, recalculate fair value of NCI or I might actually uh, recalculate the fair value of the NCI using stock exchange data, using stock exchange data. So my evidence would actually be um, my evidence for the purchase for this NCI would actually be that uh, I would expect to find recalculation. I would expect to find recalculation of NCI. I would expect to find the recalculation of NCI. I would expect to find the stock market information extracts showing the value of uh, teapot company. Then you have got cost of investment, which could actually be using the share purchase agreement. So the share purchase agreement could tell you the goodwill could be the impairment workings. The impairment working could tell you with the goodwill has been tested for not or etc. etc. So you see, you could actually write down the evidences by specifically highlighting the risk. That these are the risks that we are facing, so we can have the evidences from that. Uh, you could access uh, further uh, evidences while uh, actually. going through uh, the exam answer, but that's how it is. So um, for those of you who are having a problem with uh, the effective interest rate, so I'm just going to explain that what is the concept of effective interest rate. The concept of effective interest rate is simply the effective interest rate calculates the total cost that we bear on this loan. So all that you need to do is that you just need to actually calculate the total amount that you have paid against, that you need to pay against this loan over the period of the loan. So the total amount divided by number of years gives you the amount per year. And once you have the amount per year, what you need to do is that you need to actually divide it by the principal amount. So you will end up getting the answer. So that's how it is. Uh, let's move uh, forward. And now uh, there are part B and part C. 
So you need to actually go through part B and part C. This is a seven mark requirement for part B and a six mark requirement for part C. Let's just go through it, then we'll discuss. No, 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 Ifra, you don't have to write risk. That's what I explained yesterday also. You don't have to write the risk. All that you have to do is that you just have to write the evidence. So I'm just going to draft uh, one or two answers also uh, because uh, I think that you should know that how to draft the answer also. So I'm going to draft one or two part of it also. Uh, yes, Nadeem, you need to explain that why exactly what uh, you would expect to find what evidence is and why. Okay, try to attempt these part and then we'll discuss in 2-3 minutes.
Okay, uh, let's move forward and uh, discuss further. It says in September 2014, um, I'm going to repeat again. You see, the dates are very important. You need to understand that what are the relevant dates in the given scenario. So it says that the year end is 31st July 2014. And if something is happening in September 2014, that means that it's event after reporting period. So it's event after reporting period. A natural disaster caused severe damage to the property complex housing the group's head office and main manufacturing site. Uh, for health and safety reason, a decision was made to demolish the property complex. The demolition took place three weeks after the damage was caused. Property had a carrying value of 16 million at 31st July 2014. A contingent asset of 18 million has been recognized as current asset and as deferred income in the group. Statement of financial representing the amount claimed under the group's insurance policy in respect of disaster. Now there are two, three things which you need to understand. One of them is uh, the IS 10 events after reporting period, uh, which is uh, anything that happens from the year end till the end of reporting period. Year end till the end of reporting period. Uh, sorry. Anything that happens from the year end till the date of authorization for issue. Till the date of authorization for issue. That is all considered to be the event after reporting period. So whenever we talk about the event after reporting period, event after reporting period are of two types. And what are those events after reporting period? They are either adjusting event and they are either non-adjusting event. So what exactly is the accounting treatment for adjusting and for the non-adjusting event? For the adjusting event, what we do is that we adjust them in financial statement. We adjust them in financial statement and the non-adjusting events are disclosed if they are material. If they are material. Now, um, if you could recall from what IS 10 says that uh, adjusting events are those events that provide evidence of conditions. That provide evidence of conditions. that arose at, that existed at year end, that existed at year end. Um, so basically adjusting event are those events that provide evidence of the conditions that existed at year end and non-adjusting event indicates the events that arose after year end. Now in a, if I talk about this scenario, in this scenario what has happened is September 2, 2014, which is after reporting period, a natural disaster caused severe damage to the property complex housing the group's head office. So there was actually a natural disaster in September 14 causing a damage. So that means this event is something that is indicative of something that happened after the year end. It did not happen at the year end. It happened after the year end. And the resultingly the property is also demolished and there was a 16 million thing and etc. etc. So apparently the scenario is not for a non adjust is not for an adjusting event. It's a non adjusting event. Why is it a non adjusting event? The reason behind that is that it took place on 30th September. It provides indications of the condition that arose after year end of 31st July. So what should you do? You should not actually make this adjustment. You should instead uh, disclose it. So basically, the 16 million damage divided by the total assets of 450 million uh, gives you what? Three and a half percent. So this is three and a half percent. So you're having three and a half percent which is a material item. So what will happen is you would say three and a half percent and since the uh, 30th September is uh, after year end, therefore the natural disaster is event after reporting period and it's a non-adjusting event after reporting period. Why it's a non-adjusting event after reporting period because
Why is there a non-adjusting event after the boarding period? The reason behind that is because what happens is that uh, it provides evidence of condition that arose after year end. So what should happen is it should be disclosed in the financial. It should be disclosed in financial. And what should be disclosed? We should disclose the detail of the event and estimated financial impact. Now another area that you should talk about is basically the contingent asset that they have recorded. For the contingent asset what you should do is that the contingent asset uh, uh, does not exist at the year end. The reason behind that is the disaster took place after year end so there is no as such contingent asset. They should actually reverse it. What have they done up till now? Uh, they have uh, recognized the contingent asset as current asset and a deferred income. So they have recorded contingent asset debited by 18 and they have recorded the deferred income as credited by 18. So what should they do now? They should actually say that the deferred income would be debited by 18 and contingent asset to be credited by 18. Now, we need to talk about the various evidences that we would expect to find. We need to talk about the various evidences that we would expect to find. So if I talk about the various evidences that we would expect to find, let's just talk about them one by one. Number one evidence uh, that we need to talk is uh, that details of disaster Fixed asset register showing property of uh, 16 million. Because you see, you need to think about what would have been your risk, that the damage, what, what exactly when the data took place, was it on 30th September, was it before year end, was it after 30th September, what exactly was it, and uh, what was the carrying amount of this property, what is the surveyor report. Uh, okay, uh, another thing is that physical inspection report. Why physical inspection report? Because they say that it was being damaged, it was being demolished after three weeks after the disaster. So if it was being demolished, then uh, do we have, have we physically inspected it? If we have inspected it, then do we have the report? So all this is important. Uh, furthermore, you need to have the insurance policy, you need to have the claim made to the insurance policy, etc, etc. These are all things which are necessary for you uh, for this specific audit. Now see, Mark Company supplies some of the components used by Roberts Company in its manufacturing process. At the year end, an inter company receivable of 20 million is recognized in Mark Company's financial statement. So Mark Company, it actually supplies some of the components used by Robert at the year end, an inter company receivable of 20 million. So 20 million receivable on a total asset of 450 will give you an idea, 20 divided by 450. Uh, Robert's company finances statements include a corresponding inter company payable of 50 million and an inventory supplied from Mark's valued at 50 million. So you would talk about it that uh, this is, you'll calculate the materiality and now understand. Uh, the area to be considered over here is uh, that we need to talk about uh, that uh, since uh, Roberts and Marx are group entity, for uh, intra group receivable and payable should be eliminated. Furthermore, uh, any unrealized profit on uh, unsold inventory shall be removed. from finance statements.
and then we can talk about the evidences uh, which could actually be the consolidation schedule showing elimination uh, we could talk about uh, recalculation of unrealized profit Uh, we could talk about uh, the recalculation of unrealized profit. Then also we can talk about uh, uh, there could be the other things which could be uh, like um, ledgers of uh, both the parties in each other's books so that we can have an idea that there was a transaction of this amount. So these are the things, these are the various evidences that you would expect to find. Uh, I hope this is clear. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, do you need to actually know anything about it? Uh, Zumana Zubair, the revision kit for June 2017 is outdated. Uh, ideally speaking, you should have a new revision kit which is for September 2017 exam session. Why is that so? Because uh, there are uh, various accounting standards which have been introduced, specifically the IFRS 15 and the IFRS 16. And the revision kit is uh, being, uh, revision kit reflects a, uh, reflects amended accounting standard. SN Khan, you don't have to show the calculation of effective interest rate. It's just that I have performed the calculation to explain to you people. You could have simply written the uh, finance cost to be recognized should be using the effective interest rate. For the sufficiency and appropriate, we will talk tomorrow. Uh, Abbas, you mentioned about that uh, is in yes detail of disaster. It's just that the details of the disaster or the disaster report that what exactly the damage report that is something what I actually meant. Uh, written representation uh, that didn't don't have going concern issue. Um, uh, well, having a 16 million asset uh, on a total asset of uh, 415. So I think that's a bit of a vague thing. Uh, Rarvin knows sure, the demolition cost should not be recognized because uh, because it arose after uh, year end. The event took place after year end. It, it wasn't actually at the year end. Uh, there is no contingent asset because the event took place after year end and at the year end you did not have any asset. There was nothing in, uh, the, there had nothing, nothing had happened with you at the year end. Abbas, uh, let give me some time. I'll write down that how to write it down in the exam. They have to recover, but the point is, uh, Ifra, they cannot, uh, uh, they cannot uh, show it um, uh, in the financial for the current year. It has to go in the next year. Yes, recalculation is statement. It's not recalculation. Recalculation is a procedure. Recalculation is statement could be a procedure. I'll try to do that. Um, I personally like BPP. Uh, Farwa on the WhatsApp group, I think few people have the what's uh, few people have the revision kit. They can share that with you. Okay, if somebody has uh, the updated version, please share it.
okay for those of you who wanted to know that uh, how will we write down the answer to this question i'm just going to uh, share uh, let's say uh, one area i would say that uh, 20 million is x percent of total assets and is therefore and is therefore material since marx and roberts are group companies therefore they therefore the transaction between them shall be eliminated from the group financial statements so 20 million shall be deducted from group receivable and payable and any unrealized profit in the unsold inventory shall be removed i would expect to find following evidences in my review of working papers so you would actually write it this way but uh, extracts from consolidation schedule showing removal of intra group balance the calculation statement of the calculation statement of you you people can take a screenshot of this you don't have to write it down you can take a screenshot of this whatever that i'm writing it's just that few people were actually concerned that how will we write so that's why i'm actually uh, writing it so that uh, your uh, ambiguities are your problems is being cleared the calculation statement of unrealized profit uh furthermore ledgers of mark and roberts in each other books showing outstanding amount of 20 million dollar I hope this uh, clarifies now. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, reduce the screen size so that you can take a screenshot. Okay, so let's move uh, forward and uh, discuss further. 
so we are actually done with this area uh, we are going to move forward and the next area that we are going to move on to is going to be the audit report the next area that we are going to move on to is going to be the audit report so let's just uh, start off uh, by discussing that uh, what exactly is the audit report so we're going to talk about the audit report i've shared with you the handouts and they actually uh, include the audit report there are two handouts which is audit report 1 and the audit report 2 so you can actually open up both the handouts the audit report 1 and the audit report 2 both the handouts that are available you can open up both of them Okay, for the audit report, I would like to do some uh, discussion first and then we will uh, discuss about that what should be the audit opinion in XYZ scenarios and uh, all other things. So let's just start discussing first about this uh, audit report. As you all know that uh, as you all know that the as you all know that the uh, format for the audit report has actually changed so uh, it's very important to know that uh, uh, what is the new format and uh, how it all operates because uh, at times what happens is you come across exam scenarios where it says uh, evaluate uh, or critically appraise the audit report so when it says critically appraise the audit report your examiner is expecting you to even tell him that where has he gone wrong with respect to the structure with respect to the overall presentation of the audit report also so you need to know that contents of the audit report like uh, what exactly comes in first what comes in second these all things are important so let's just talk about the independent auditor report that what are the components of independent auditor report Abbas you can access the handout from the window Okay, um, the major changes to the audit reports have been initially what used to happen was that uh, the entire audit report was a very simplified report which did not have much of the comp much of the contents. The only content that was there in the audit report is uh, that it had a specific set format and that set format um, used to operate like this that it, ha it, it included the introduction para and that included the account auditor's responsibility, management responsibility and there was a very small para at the end of the report indicating that uh, the uh, indicating the type of the opinion that the auditor expresses so earlier it used to be like this but now uh, over a period of time when the audit report has actually changed the ISA has revised so the revised ISA when it talks about the audit report, uh, the first thing that it starts off with is the audit opinion. So the first thing that it starts off in the ISA is the audit opinion. So I'm going to talk about the audit opinion that uh, how does it start off. If you could see this uh, audit opinion para, the first paragraph you would see the overall introduction about the company ABC that this is the audited, we have audited the financials of ABC company for the period ending so and so and uh, it covers the X, Y, Z statement so you could see now the opinion paragraph is the first para with an introduction and the second para actually reflects the audit opinion which says in our opinion the accompanying financials present fairly in all material respects or give true and fair view of the financial position of the company Okay, so the next paragraph is the basis for opinion para. It was never there. Uh, it has been included now. I mean, uh, the basis for opinion paragraph earlier in the audit report used to be only when there was, uh, it was only when there was um, a modified opinion. 
if there was no modified opinion the basis for opinion paragraph never existed so the basis for opinion paragraph the auditor generally states that we have conducted our audit in accordance with isa and uh, also that uh, we are independent auditor in accordance uh, with the uh, international ethical standards for the um, uh, accountants and then also uh, that the audit evidence that we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate for us to be a form an opinion so these are the main important thing that the auditor talks about in the basis for opinion paragraphs so you could have a quick reading of the basis for opinion paragraph also Now let's move forward. Um, uh, in addition to this audit report is this key audit matter section. Now what exactly is this key audit matter? So there is a specific um, ISA that has been introduced for uh, this key audit matter. There's a specific ISA which has been introduced for the key audit matter. So I'm going to discuss about that ISA. So it's actually ISA 701 which has been introduced for the key audit matter. Now what exactly is the objective of this ISA? I'm going to discuss about this ISA. So um, ISA 701 has been introduced. It discusses the key audit matters. Now what are key audit matters? So the key audit matters are generally whenever you are performing an audit, you come across, whenever you are performing an audit, you come across a lot of matters uh, which you discuss with management and those charged with governance. So when we discuss a lot of matters which we discuss with management and those charged with governance. So amongst those matters, there are few matters which are very significant, which are very important. And the auditor thinks that uh, he should uh, disclose it to the users of the financial statement. So such matters are actually termed as key audit matters. So what are key audit matters? Key audit matters are the matters that the auditor discusses with management and those charged with governance. And these are the matters which in the auditor's opinion are of such significance. These are the matters which are of such significance in the auditor's opinion that uh, that the auditor should report them to the shareholders. That's why he presents them under the CAM section of the report. So if I talk about it that uh, how is it presented in the CAM section, you look at this uh, audit report and you read the key audit matter section of the report. So if you see, so it clearly says that in our professional judgment, what of most significance in our audit of financial statements of the current period, etc., etc., and then you have to give the description of each of the key audit matter in accordance with either 701. So what do you need to do? You need to give the description of each of the key audit matter in accordance with either 701. Now let's move uh, forward and let's just discuss further. So I'm going to talk about that. What is the description that we give for any key audit matter? So the description that we give for any key audit matter is what is the matter? Why is it a key audit matter? And what has auditor done in respect of this matter. So that's what you have to do. That uh, what is the matter? Why is it a key audit matter? And what has the auditor done in respect 
aspect of this matter so this is the important thing so this is number 1 this is number 2 and this is number 3 so this is what you have to do so you have to write down so like the audit report originally the audit report uh, was not that descriptive was not that elaborative but over a period of time ever since this either 701 came in the audit report format changed so the key audit matter actually gives more insight to the user about the company um, the auditor actually gave highlights that uh, like for example if I talk about a company we could say that there is a company which has got problems with the revenue recognition policy the auditor discussed with management those charged with governance and the auditor ultimately got satisfied with the management's policy but then he did had issues so he could actually discuss about that uh, in the um, key audit matter section that the entity had this revenue recognition policy which could be subjective which could be etc and then we performed XYZ audit procedure and the result of the XYZ audit procedure was that we can now conclude that the matter has been correctly addressed by the management so uh, in the key audit matter section of the report uh, only those matters are presented I'm repeating in the CAM section of the report in the CAM section of the report only those matters are reflected uh, which are uh, which the auditor is satisfied are uh, correctly presented I mean uh, the auditor might not have been initially ready to accept these matters the way they were presented but subsequent stage the auditor might have actually recognized that no uh, they have been correctly presented and we can now actually um, they've been correctly presented but still we need to reflect it to the management so that's what the CAM section is so the report has got the CAM section and once we are done with the CAM section there is this other information section. Now what is this other information section that I am going to explain. Um, if you could open up the next PDF file which is about uh, audit report 2. So in that file you will uh, find this page number uh, 3 in that file the audit report 2 file there is this page number 3. So you would find examples of amounts or other items that may be included in other information. So there is items of key financial results. Let's say if I talk about its key financial result, you could see when you look at the financial statements of any company, you would find that there would be some specific um, uh, five-year history of the company, uh, bar charts, various pie charts, various uh, diagrams showing the historical performances of the company, showing the projected results of the company, etc. So you might actually come across a lot of things in the um, annual report. So whenever the annual report is published, the annual report includes, in addition to the financial statement, a lot of things. So generally speaking, all those things are the other information. So uh, basically what happens is uh, there is a section which is other information, uh, which is accompanying the financial statement. And the way this section is presented is uh, you open up then again the file of audit report 2 and you find uh, page number uh, 6 of that report uh, come on to page number 6 and you can actually read this uh, whole Okay, now number one, uh, it says other information. So you could read from here that the auditor's responsibility is to read the other information accompanying the financial statements. 
and uh, in case if the auditor thinks that there is an inconsistency in the other information then the auditor should actually reflect the uh, should discuss with management and those charged with governance if they agree then good enough if they don't agree then the auditor has to actually reflect them here in this um, specific section of the report that uh, X, Y, Z other information uh, shows information which is inconsistent with the financial statement so the auditor can do that. The auditor could simply do that that he could actually talk about that this other information is not uh, correctly presented. Um, we will take a break. We'll have uh, an Amaz uh, break for 20 minutes and uh, we're gonna then start off at uh, 7.20 p.m.
Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, so we were discussing before the break uh, about this audit report. So up till now what we have talked about is the next area for the audit report is other information. And we said that the auditor's responsibility is to read the other information accompanying the financial statement. In case if the auditor thinks that uh, the other information does not give the correct information or the correct picture, then what he should actually do is that he should discuss with management and those charged with governance. If they agree to amend it, then good enough. If they don't agree to amend it, then the auditor should actually um, the auditor should actually uh, mention in this other information section that X Y Z area is not being uh, correctly presented in the in, in the inform other information is not correctly presented. And that so that the users are aware about it because you see what happens is when you are reviewing the annual report of any company Usually what happens is while reviewing the annual report uh, We see the initial pages of the report which includes the director's report which includes the Forecast etc etc. So we need to make sure that we don't actually uh, confine ourselves to that now next is the responsibility of management and those charged with governance. Uh, the, IFA, the ISA now specifically explains that uh, who is management and who is those charged with governance. So it's actually the responsibility of management, it remains the same, is to prepare the financial statements uh, in accordance with the uh, IFRS and also to maintain internal controls and uh, the responsibility and to actually assessing the going concern status of the entity. Furthermore, those charged with governance are responsible for overseeing the company's financial reporting issues. So this was never there in the report and this has now been presented in the report. That is that uh, uh, the, it was already there that the management is responsible for preparing the financial statements in accordance with applicable framework and that the management is also responsible for uh, maintaining internal controls. But it was never mentioned that uh, the management is responsible for assessing the going concern status. Furthermore, those charged with governance was never mentioned that uh, they have the responsibility for overseeing, overseeing this whole. And then there is this auditor's responsibility which indicates um, a few things which is that uh, that we are giving a reasonable assurance and second thing is that the reasonable assurance is a high level of assurance but is not a guarantee that an audit is conducted in accordance with IDA will always detect misstatement when it exists. So these are the important things. So this is this other auditor's responsibility section and then uh, we've got a section on uh, report and other regulatory requirements uh, which is depending upon the local laws and then you have got the name of the engagement partner, got the signature of the engagement partner um, and then at the same time auditor address and the date. So these are the general uh, content of the audit report and they have changed, uh, the, the sequence have changed, uh, every, a lot of things have actually changed. Now let's move forward and uh, this is actually the basics of the audit report that we have gone through. We are now going to discuss further and we are now going to discuss that uh, Okay, now let's discuss that uh, what other types of uh, this is this is generally either 700 that we have discussed. We have talked about either 701 also. Now let's just talk about either 705, which talks about the modifications to the report. Either 705, which talks about the modifications to the report. Uh, now, if I talk about modification to report, so you do know that the modifications are of actually three types. One of them is a qualified opinion and what do we say in the qualified opinion? We say except for, we say except for so and so, financial statements give a true and fair view. Uh, this is what happens in the model in the qualified report. Now number two is basically your uh, adverse opinion and how do we write the adverse opinion? So the adverse opinion is written this way. Uh, we say that whenever we talk about the adverse opinion, we say that financial statements 
do not give a true and fair view financial statements do not give a true and fair view and lastly there is this uh, disclaimer of opinion and whenever we give this disclaimer of opinion we actually uh, say that uh, we do not express an opinion we say we do not express an opinion on the financial statements so that's what it is uh, now let's move uh, forward so this is actually three types of uh, opinion uh, modifications that we have to the financial statement now we are going to discuss that uh, what are the reasons for giving such modifications now what could be the reasons for giving such modifications could be uh, it could either be that uh, financial statements are materially misstated so one of the reasons could be that the financial statements are materially misstated and the other reason could be that uh, unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit opinion unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit opinion that's number two so financial statements are materially misstated or unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence now let's just talk about it if I say that the financial statements are materially misstated if I say that financial statements are materially misstated or you are unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence these are the two things on the basis of which we actually modify the opinion now let's move further and let's just discuss further uh, there is a terminology which is called uh, pervasiveness there is a terminology which is called pervasiveness when you will actually open up uh, this audit report handout also you will find the definition of pervasive you will find the definition of pervasive on uh, page number uh, 5 so you will find the definition of it so what exactly is uh, the term pervasive actually means so it says uh, in the context of misstatements to describe the effects of the finance, the financial statements of misstatement or the possible effect, if any, that are undetected due to inability to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence. The pervasive effects on financial are those that in the auditor's judgment. Now, I'm going to explain this that what is pervasiveness. So when we talk about the pervasiveness, so the pervasiveness actually refers to uh, that you see whenever whenever you are actually modifying the opinion so the opinion is definitely going to be modified on some specific matter now what could be that matter that matter could be that the entity has not stated the inventory correctly the matter could actually be that uh, you are unable to access the inventory of the company therefore you cannot actually confirm that the entity's uh, inventory is correctly valued or not etc so these could be the various things so what is pervasiveness pervasiveness whenever we talk about the pervasiveness pervasiveness actually means that the matter which is under consideration or the matter which uh, actually on the basis of which we are uh, modifying the opinion is uh, very important is uh, very significant now what is pervasiveness defined uh, by ISA so ISA says that pervasiveness is whenever uh, multiple elements are misstated whenever the multiple elements are misstated that is what pervasiveness is that's number one like for example you are auditing the financials you figure out that uh, inventory is misstated you figure out that receivable is misstated so when you figure out that these multiple items are misstated so what actually happens if this is an indication of pervasive effect now next thing so multiple uh, elements are uh, misstated so whenever you've got multiple elements which are misstated that is pervasiveness now number two is that uh, when we talk about it uh, so we've got multiple elements which are misstated number two thing is uh, a single element is misstated but it's a substantial portion 
Now, a lot of you would be that, what do we mean by this substantial portion? So, practically it is uh, around uh, 25 to 30 percent is substantial portion. Now, what is that substantial portion? Example is that you have got uh, machinery or you've got a plant uh, which constitutes 45 percent of the total net assets of the balance sheet. And the management is not letting you access that plant. Management is not letting you access that plant. If the management is not letting you access that plan, that means the matter is pervasive. And the third thing is, whenever we talk about the pervasiveness, so the third matter under uh, when it comes to the pervasiveness is actually uh, that uh, it pertains to a significant disclosure. Now, what is that significant disclosure? If we talk about a general financial statement of the entity, so the significant disclosure when it comes to general financial is pertaining to going concern. So maybe the going concern assumption is incorrect. So maybe the going concern disclosure is inappropriate. That all indicates pervasiveness. So now, uh, let's move uh, forward. And let's just discuss further. So we have talked about that what is pervasiveness. So first thing is you need to understand if the matter is pervasive or not. Now, if the matter is pervasive or not, so you need to understand that how exactly are we going to deal with it. Uh, we are going to deal with it this way. We're going to deal it with this way. Now, what is going to be this way of dealing with it is that Okay, so let's just talk about this pervasiveness. Now, first of all, we said that there could be the two things with respect to the uh, these things. One of them is financial statements are materially misstated. The other one of them is you are unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. Now, uh, if we look at it, financial statements are materially misstated. What do we mean by that? Financial statements are materially misstated. We mean by that is Number one of them is basically uh, you would see whether the matter is material, matter is pervasive or non-pervasive. So uh, let's say okay, this is the column which is of not pervasive. So if this is not pervasive, then means uh, whether it's a material misstatement or whether it's inability to obtain evidence. In both the cases, it's going to be qualified opinion. The second one of them is if the matter is pervasive. If the matter is pervasive, then you need to see that what is the reason for modification. Is that because the financial statements are materially misstated, then you need to give an adverse opinion, which is the financial do not give a true and fair view. But if it's a matter which is inability to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence, then it has to be a disclaimer of opinion. So you need to understand these two things, which is, is the matter pervasive or non-pervasive? If the matter is pervasive, if the matter is not pervasive, then it's going to be qualified opinion no matter what happens. But if the matter is pervasive, then you need to see what's the reason. Is it material misstatement? Then it's adverse. If it's not material misstatement, if it's inability to obtain evidence, then it's disclaimer of opinion. So uh, you should be able to detect this uh, in the given scenario. That's important. Now what next? Uh, in the audit report one, we have actually mentioned about this uh, qualified opinions. So you would see that uh, the heading of the report changes from opinion to qualified opinion. The heading of the um, opinion para changes from opinion to qualified opinion, number one. Uh, so you could see that it's the same introduction para, it's just that in our opinion, except for the effects of the matter described in basis for qualification para, uh, the company financials give a true and fair view. Now next, instead of basis for opinion, it will become basis for qualified opinion. So when we talk about it, it's basis for qualified opinion. It says that uh, companies' inventories are carried in the SOFP at so and so. 
Uh, so you see now here the entity faced this issue that the company's inventory were misstated. They were not stated at the lower of cost or NRV. So they actually discussed about it that uh, if there is an effect, uh, if there is actually, if the company's inventory would have been carried at the lower of cost or NRV, then what would have been the effect on the financial statement? So you see when it comes to the basis for qualified opinion paragraph, you need to talk about few things. Number one of them is, what exactly is the matter? I mean, see the inventories, so you need to talk about the carrying amount. Then you need to talk what is the problem. Like the management has not stated the inventories at the lower of cost or NRV. Then the third thing is that the effect, the effect of the rectification on the specific amount and on the cost of sale or the net income and the shareholders equity, the effect. And the same goes for uh, the key audit matter section also that uh, uh, in the key audit matter section, you say in addition to the matter described in basis for qualified opinion section, we have determined the matters described below to be the key audit matters to be communicated in our report. Now there is there are two things which I would like to clarify over here, which are important. And what are those two things? Number one, at times the student find it difficult for the key audit matter section that how to actually, um, I mean, what is a key audit matter? So see, the key audit matter, I will repeat again, it is in the auditor's judgment. One of those matters in the auditor's judgment should be, should be, should be uh, brought to the attention of the shareholders to the user of financial statement. And the important thing is, it should be amongst the matters which are discussed with management and those charged with governance. So it has to be amongst the matters which are discussed with management and those charged with governance. Number one. Number two. <laughs> Um, whenever we have got a modification to opinion, whether that be qualified, whether that be adverse opinion. So whenever we have got modification to opinion, so such a matter is also a key audit matter. Now repeat, why is such a matter a key audit matter? Because had it not been a key audit matter, it would not have been so important that it could lead to modification. So the, whenever we have got a modification, the modification is also on a key audit matter. But what is what is what do we need to do so amongst the various key audit matter if a key audit matter is being resolved I mean the management actually explains to you that they have done XYZ accounting treatment and for what reason etc etc and if you are satisfied with that it will be shown in the key audit matter section of the report but if you're not satisfied if there is a dispute between you and the management and that dispute stays unresolved, then what will happen is you will you will actually use such a key audit matter to be explained in the basis for the modified opinion paragraph and you would modify the opinion on the basis of such key audit matter. So if you read this key audit matter section of this qualified report, it says in addition to the matter described in the basis for qualified opinion by section, we have determined the matters below to be the key audit matter. So in addition to that, so that's what you need to understand and then uh, you need to understand one more thing which is uh, the concept of disclaimer of opinion. You see, when we give a disclaimer of opinion, we say we do not express an opinion on the accompanying consolidated financials of the group. And then you give a basis for disclaimer of opinion. So remember one thing, whenever there is a disclaimer of opinion, there will be no key audit matter section in the report. There will be no key audit matter section in the report. You would say why? The reason behind that is among in the key audit matter section of the report, you say that amongst the manage we, we do not express a separate opinion. I mean you you actually say that whatever the opinion is there in the finance on the financial statement as a whole, that's the same opinion for these matters on under the CAM section. But now since you are not giving an opinion, then this does not make sense that you can actually discuss about CAM because CAM actually refers to the matter which have been resolved between you and the management and you're okay with those matters. 
So how could it be possible that you are giving a disclaimer at one side and you are actually giving this um, um, CAM section in the same report? You can't do that. So that is an important area which is about disclaimer opinion. So I think uh, that is all about ISA 705 also. Um, I think it's been some time that I haven't answered your question. So I will actually answer your uh, questions first and then I'll move forward. Uh, Daud, your uh, query is uh, you will get the recorded lecture. The ACC has a policy they would actually uh, send across the lecture. Uh, Daud, uh, you already have the link. If you are unable to join through that link, uh, please uh, drop in your SM, your number here. Somebody can actually uh, send a message to you. Uh, for, uh, for the other matter section, just wait for a minute. Yes, uh, the other information section. Uh, to an extent, uh, the matters which used to be discussed in other matter paragraph have largely been replaced with this other information section. So yes, there is a lot of thing. I'm going to explain what is other matter and what is other information. Just wait for a second. Uh, CAM has been applicable Rabia for some time now. Just wait for a while. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna actually recall all the things. So now see. We were on to it uh, that uh, these are the few things which we have discussed with respect to the audit report and with respect to the basis for disclaimer of opinion, etc., etc. Uh, now let's just talk about uh, the emphasis of matter and other matter. Okay, what is this emphasis of matter and other matter? A lot of you would be concerned that uh, I talked about the key audit matter section. Now, where does the EOM comes in? Where does the other matter goes, etc.? So now let's just try to understand that what is EOM and what is uh, other matter etc and how are they different from CAM. So whenever we talk about the emphasis of matter and the other matter, so it's ISA 706 which talks about the emphasis of matter and other matter section. So emphasis of matters in accordance with ISA 706 is refers Emphasis of matter is a para included by auditor in order to draw attention of users to 
पैरामीटर करेक्टली रिफ्लेक्टेड इन फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट सो व्हाट इज एम्फेसिस ऑफ मैटर एम्फेसिस ऑफ मैटर इज अ पैरा इंक्लूडेड बाय द ऑडिटर इन ऑर्डर टू ड्रॉ द अटेंशन ऑफ द यूजर्स टू अ मैटर करेक्टली रिफ्लेक्टेड इन फाइनेंशियल नाउ मेनी ऑफ यू वुड हैव कंसर्न्स दैट ओके दैट इफ ईओएम is there to reflect a matter which is correctly presented in financial statement and cam is also there to reflect those matters which the auditor thinks have been correctly reflected by the financial statement then what is the difference between eom and cam so now see the main difference between eom and cam are um the eom and cam the major differences between them are that cam is amongst the matter discussed with management and those charged with governance if there is a matter which we have not discussed with management and those charged with governance it cannot be under the cam section but there is no such thing for eom eom doesn't need to be discussed with management and those charged with governance number 2 uh for the cam it usually refers to an area of risk in the audit like an area where you and management have argued the area where you and management have actually had some discussion but eom generally refers to where as such there is no dispute where there is as such no argument so both the matters are correctly reflected in financials but on one matter we had an argument with management and on the other matter we had no argument with the management then next we give detail of work done uh over here there is no detail of work it says that in the emphasis of matter section we just say we draw attention to note x in the financial statement we say we draw attention to the note we draw attention to note x of the financial statement which describes the effect of the fire in the company's production facilities our opinion is not modified in respect of this matter like it's a matter which management wanted to highlight but then again the management says that it's being correctly reflected so uh, the auditor says it's being correctly reflected by the management so we don't need, need to really actually uh, say uh, much about it now let's move forward uh, so this is actually we are done with this uh, emphasis of matter now let's just talk about the other matter section so when we talk about the other matter section so i'm going to explain that what is other matter the other matter refers to a matter other than finances i mean a matter which is not pertaining to financial statement is another matter so i'm repeating it again a matter which is not pertaining to financial statement is another matter like for example uh like for example if i say uh, that what exactly is going to be other matter so uh, earlier the information which is presented in other information section used to be presented in other matter section like for example there is a report by the management and that report is not part of financial statement it's just part of annual report so there is some report by the management uh, the contents of which are not in line with the contents of the financial so what is the management going to do so if the contents are not in line with the contents of the financial so what exactly is the management going to do so it is actually going to be uh, that um, the management used to give other matter para but now the other matter where only covers uh, matters which are not reflected in other information like for example there are few things that uh, last year financial statements were audited by another auditor or uh, maybe you could say that uh, last year financials were not audited etc etc so this is what the other matter section reflects uh i 
hope this is clear now. Uh, so what we are going to do now is uh, we are going to move forward and uh, we shall discuss one of the questions on the audit report. Okay, uh, let's uh, go on to December 2014. Question number uh, five. Part B. Uh, you need to go through this area. Uh, kindly go through this question, uh, read this question, and we'll discuss in five minutes' time.
So it's December 14, question number uh, 5, part B.
कल कुछ आपके लिए रिफ्रेश पर मंगा लेंगे ना पहले से आप बता दीजिएगा
okay uh, welcome back everybody there was uh, some technical issue and uh, we could not unfortunately uh, go on in a proper manner because of that technical issue i do understand uh, a lot of you people are having concern that the class got uh, boring and the class got disturbing um, i do realize this thing in order to make up for that i will extend the class uh, by i would extend the class by 30 35 minutes uh, uh, for both the coming days uh, just to make sure that uh, we have been able to make up for the lost uh, time because of the technical faults during the course of the day and uh, also uh, because of these uh, issues that have actually arisen um what i actually want to discuss is um, actually i would have discussed the question but unfortunately i think uh, it since it's not uh, announced in advance that the class is going to uh, continue for a longer period so a lot of you might not have actually been uh, um uh, prepared for it so what i am just going to write down is uh, i can actually give you few questions which you can attempt and then uh, and then uh, we can uh, come back and we can discuss tomorrow on these questions uh, so that uh, we could actually have a bit uh, of a fast move now one of the question that you can actually talk about is uh, it's uh, december 2014 question number 5 uh, which i already mentioned question number 5 part b that's one of the question that you uh, should do from home uh the other question that you should do is uh, this uh, june 2016 and this is question number 5 uh, again so it's june 2016 question 5 uh the third one of them is uh, december 2015 and this is uh, question number 5 uh, again so i would just write down the name of these uh, questions so this is actually hopper group this is hopper group uh this question is uh, this question is boston company and this is bradley so this is what it is now uh these are the questions which i would want you people to actually go through at home so we can have uh, a discussion uh, tomorrow on these questions uh, now for the questions that you have actually uh, asked me so i am going to start replying to every single question that you people uh, were asking um 833 okay we we had this technical issue at around uh, 8 uh, 12 pm so uh, let me answer all the questions um what happened let me do the group Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, if the adverse opinion actually means that uh, you say that the financial statement do not give a true and fair view, why would we go for an adverse opinion? The adverse opinion is given. uh because when the financial statements are materially misstated and uh, the matter is pervasive in nature so that's why we given uh, that's why we given uh, adverse opinion uh punam uh, see the revision kit also has the past paper so it's actually uh, uh, i would recommend that uh, you specifically i mean i would just give a list of the questions that you need to attempt so i would suggest that you attempt those uh, 15 questions that i say so you could actually do that well i actually wrote down a specific question about that how to discuss the, the management and those charges how to discuss uh, the, the 
comment on the matters. So I talked about it that we talk about materiality. Um, okay, you are asking about key audit matters. So I talked about this key audit matter that whenever there is a key audit matter, we specify, we explain what is the matter. Then we explain that why is it a key audit matter. And the third thing is what have we done with respect to this matter. Okay, Rabi, a disclaimer of opinion is basically when you say we are not giving any opinion. When you say we are not giving any opinion, that's called disclaimer of opinion. Now, why would you not give an opinion? You would not give an opinion because uh, you had insufficient uh, evidence and the matter was pervasive that uh, you preferred not to give an opinion. Uh, for the group audit, Daud, we did a question called Teapot Company December 14, question 2. Uh, Hamid, uh, continue with me during this session. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, the session today was very, uh, was not, uh, um, had issues in the last one hour or so. So um, uh, we will extend the session uh, tomorrow and day after tomorrow also so that uh, we could cover up for the lost time. Uh, we would extend one break for 10 minutes and then we would cover up uh, say around 30 minutes every day. Wali, um, to what extent we need to discuss such I mean it's to what extent it's just that you need to discuss about their relevant accounting treatment that's it um, okay um, anyways uh, that's it uh, for today right now um, uh, you need to attempt these uh, questions and uh, the class will be extended on uh, Thursday and on Friday that is it will be 6 to 9.40 uh, p.m. or 9.45 p.m. 6 to 9.45 p.m. so that's how the class will go on uh, with two breaks one for the Maghrib Namaz and one uh, just around uh, this Isha time so that's how we'll go about for the next two days. <sighs> Rana Imran, I have not actually discussed the last question about this uh, um, this audit report so please give me time for tomorrow that I'll discuss the question with you people in uh, a bit of detail for tomorrow uh, no no problem Sanya I mean if the session is being conducted it's just being conducted to ensure that you people enhance your chances of passing and uh, that's why I'm actually staying very much uh, exam focused and uh, we can cover up for the lost time, whatever that is. Awajiya uh, Khalid, emphasis of matter is actually given when the auditor wishes to highlight a matter which has been correctly presented in the financial statement. Anyways, uh, let's keep it till here. Uh, we will continue tomorrow at the same time, 6 o'clock, and we'll continue it till uh, 9.45 p.m. So, uh, hoping to... Uh, if from my suggestion to you would be that if you open up the BPP kit, you will get an analysis of the questions. Queen Mary, uh, as earlier we told you, that um, the, the the recordings would be available after the uh, session is over. Anyways, uh, so uh, let's, Wali, I mean, I don't understand that what do you need to know? Uh, 
amended question you should do. Vali, you need to wait till tomorrow because I have not gone through the questions uh, up till now for the reporting. Ifra, the WhatsApp group has already been shared uh, on this uh, chat earlier. Also, you follow the link to that. And please, I would request everybody to actually uh, talk about uh, um, talk about the subject only because uh, then a lot of uh, actually um, other talks start and that's not good for the group because then it loses its significance. Anyways, uh, let's keep it till here. Let's uh, meet up tomorrow and then we'll discuss further. Okay, I will send across very in email form. I'll ask them to send across in the email form. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, see you all tomorrow, inshallah.